Yeah. 
part where it says, he's the name above all names. He is so worthy of our praise. I guess um, I'm going to read from you to you from Psalms. And this is why I guess this is hitting me. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my raising up, rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is no, not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. There should be five and six. Let's see. And it says, Thou hast, thou has, thou has, thou have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot attain it. That's how great our God is. That he knows everything about you. He knows when you're home, he knows when you're at work. He puts a hedge around you. He knows every word that's going to come out of your mouth before you even say it. He knows every thought. He knows everything. And yet, he's, it, the last verse, it says that such knowledge, it's too wonderful for me. And it's too high. I cannot attain it. That right there was just what I was thinking as we were singing that. We have no way to grasp or contain the love of God and how important you are to him. In Psalms 122, verse 1, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. <laughs> wow. How many of y'all were happy to come into the house of the Lord this morning? That's why I come in here every morning and say, are y'all ready? Because we should come excited and ready because we're serving a God like this. Hallelujah. Oh, man, that's exciting. And that's why I get excited, and that's why I want you to be as excited as I am because God is so good. That was a perfect song to lead into what I was going to read this morning because it's just help, hopefully just to give you all something to sit on this morning as we continue in our worship this morning and in our service. God is so good. You know, we have a testimony that we just want to keep giving God honor and praise. We have earned so, mo so far for our parking lot $2,393.80. God is so good. And it's going to keep growing. 
That's over $1,400 from last Sunday when I told y'all. Can you imagine? $1,400. Come on, y'all. Come on. $1,400. That's within a week. That's awesome. I mean, God, that's, God is good. So just know that. Keep knowing that it's just going to keep building. Every time we step out in faith like we are, the little bit that you think that doesn't mean anything to us means everything to God. A dollar, 50 cents, you know, five dollars, 50 dollars, whatever, 500, whatever it is, it adds up. And so we're going to reach that goal with God's help. We're also, I'm going to just mention real quickly too, what before we take up the tithing, we want to have, um, uh, ask if anybody wants to sponsor youth as we go get ready for the youth camp this, this coming months. Please know that when you invest and you sponsor youth, you're sponsoring our future. The same excitement that we want, I feel this morning, it wouldn't have been possible if somebody didn't help me to get the ability to go and learn about the Lord. So these youth, they need to know that it's not just for us older people, more knowledgeable, but the people that you know, they're young, and they're our future, and they're the ones that are going to, you know, take our place one day. So we want to get them encouraged. We want them to be excited. We want them to go around other youth that are going to be like them, that they can be encouraged and see that they have other people, other kids that are just like them, excited and on fire for the Lord. So let's get our kids excited about that. So if the Lord leads you to, you know, give a little something as well, please note it on the envelope too, what it's designated for like you do the parking lot if you want to do a youth etc etc so think about it this morning guys pray about it search your heart as you um, get ready to give this morning okay we thank you so much thank you lord father we just give you all the glory father we just love you lord and as we've read in your word this morning you are our creator there is nothing you don't know about us lord you know everything from the moment we raise, rise from the bed till we put our feet on the ground, till we close our eyes at night. Father, we just pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to search our hearts, that we would be obedient to you in the direction you'd have us to go and whatever you'd like for us to give. I pray, dear Lord, for each um, situation that we're believing for. We're believing, Lord, and know that we already have our parking lot built. Father, we know that our youth are going to be on fire and excited about you, Lord. And so, Lord, we just thanking you already for what is going to be done and all that is going to be given unto your kingdom. Father, in the process for their faith, that you would bless them abundantly, Father, that they would lack and want for nothing for their obedience to you, Father. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, come on up. Run on up. Give us all your money. Yay! Look at the excitement. See, this is our future. This is our future. Happy faces, happy cheer, amen. Thank you, everyone. Before we get started, we're going to go over a few announcements. Um, the kids can make their way back to the classroom. Uh, so we got midweek Bible study going on. Uh, it's ongoing every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. We do the uh, Spanish and English uh, Bible study. So if you're not part and want to join, please come down. And if you are, keep on coming. Uh, Second announcement is the garage sale and fish plate sale was a huge success. As Sandra mentioned, as Sandra just mentioned, that's amazing. We made over $1,266. Everybody, round of applause for everybody that put in. I mean, that's just, that's great. That's a big, uh, that's what we do as a church, as a community, as a family. We come together when we raise money for the right causes. Amen. So um, that parking lot's moving right up. We're over 2300 bucks. That's amazing from when we first started in it seemed like we got stuck there at first in the rut. We couldn't get wheels going, but look where we're at. You know, we're, we were not far removed from when we just started this. So we're going to have a parking lot soon, folks. Uh, so keep, keep tithing, keep offering. And uh, if you know anyone that wants to donate, 
reach out to them. Let them know it's for a great cause. Amen. Um, the next announcement is the National Day of Prayer in Lockhart. That is coming up on Thursday, May 3rd. Um, that's going to be from 12 to 1 p.m., and they have it down at the old courthouse lawn. So if anybody's interested in coming and joining and just sitting out on the lawn and, and praying with the town, um, last year it was our first time attending, Jessica and I, and it was amazing. It's beautiful watching the, uh, the youth, the different denominations from the town come together and just pray over the town. So it's a wonderful experience if you've never been there. Come on out and enjoy it. I know it's during the day, people are working, but if you're able to get away, come down and join us. Um, last but not least is going to be the uh, youth camp. Again, as Sandra mentioned, a lot of young hearts, a lot of young minds going in there to grow with the Lord. So let's uh, push for that. Let's, let's get them going, and we're going to um, get them ready for, the, for life. Amen. Uh, camp Sequoia, located at 965 uh, FM 1340 in Hunt, Texas. It's going to go on June 26th to 29th. Uh, the cost is still $90 per kid, so again, this is covering the meals, rooms, t-shirts, activities they're going to be doing. Um, a lot of stuff, swimming, swimming the river, games, you know, you guys, some of you guys went, so uh, get ready to go again in the summer. Get, get with Pastor Bianca if you have anything, and like Sister Sandra said, if you want to donate to help out, that's fine. You know, a dollar is great, uh, everything's a blessing from one dollar to one kid, so anyone that wants to help out, do so, because uh, we're going to send every kid that signs up, that's going to be the goal, and we're going to make this happen. They're going to get there and, and get some get fed by the word. Amen. Uh, so that's all I got. We're going to do some fundraisers for that as well. So we'll stay tuned and we'll get some of that. Uh, we'll get me and Pastor Kyle and a few other of the elders. We'll get, they'll get together and we'll, we'll kind of come up with a date and what we're going to do. So uh, raise money for the youth. Amen. That's the next, that's the next goal. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get everybody to stand up, say hello to one another, and we'll give the mic over to Pastor Kyle. Amen. Praise God. We do serve a good God, don't we? A big God. Hallelujah. And I think we need to, just, sometimes we just need to stretch ourselves. Amen? Because, you know, as Sandra was saying, the, the knowledge of God, it's, it's so high we can't attain it. And 
you know, sometimes God's going to stretch us in life, and we have to be prepared for that. And, uh, but it's a good stretching, right? Because it, it produces good results in us. It's never comfortable at first when you're being stretched, but you know that at the end of that stretching, man, you're able to reach more, to do more. You understand more. Praise God. So I believe the Lord is stretching our hearts. I believe the Lord is stretching our minds, our ability uh, to receive from him and to walk in his power. Praise God. So let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll get started here. Father God, thank you for this morning. We are so, so blessed to know you. We are so blessed to know uh, what eternal life is, God, to know your love, to know uh, your wisdom, God. It's, it's just such a blessing to fellowship with you every single day. May we never take that for granted, God. We thank you that at any hour of the day or night, Lord, that you are listening and you are watching. And we thank you that you are very aware of where we're at, and you care about us, and we thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for uh, the word that's going to go forth today. I I pray that, I thank you for your Holy Spirit leading me, and I just thank you for for the hearers, Lord, who are here to receive faithfully and apply it to their life, and I thank you for, for blessing us as we apply your word, and not just hear it, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the title of today's message is Access Denied. Access Denied. And the Lord is sharing some tremendous revelation with me that I'm very excited about sharing. I believe I'm excited about it because it's going to set us free. Amen. The Bible says you know the truth and the truth will set you free. So I believe there's going to be some, some more freedom in this place. How many of you believe there's more levels of freedom for you? Amen. Levels of freedom in your health, in your marriage, in your relationship with the Lord, come on, praise God. Some of us don't feel like we're that strong in our relationship with God. There's more levels of freedom to be had for us. And the Lord is getting us there. He is. So we just need to trust him. Amen. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into this. Let's go over here to John eight forty four. John eight forty four. And we're going to, we're, really what we're going to do in these next couple weeks is we're going to expose Satan. We're going to learn about Satan and how he works. And it's not weird, okay? Some of you say, oh, we're going to learn about Satan. This is, you know, <laughs> what kind of a church are we? You need to know your enemy, Amen. brothers and sisters. We need to know what we're up against, who we're up against. So don't be intimidated. Don't be scared, as I like to say. All right, scared, for those of you who didn't know what that meant. Don't be scared. Um, this is going to bless us. So here in John 8, 44, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, Jesus was talking to the religious people. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we need to understand that Satan is a murderer. From the beginning, he was a murderer. He had evil in his heart. And we have to understand that Satan is out to murder us, to kill us. And we're going to talk about how he does that. And it's, it's not what you think. Satan is not out to kill your marriage. Satan is not out to kill... Your health, Satan is not out to kill, um, you know, good relationships in your life. He's not out to kill your finances. And I, and I want us to, and some of you are like, what? <laughs> we're we're going to get into it, okay? But there's one thing Satan is after, one thing, and we're going to find out what that one thing is and why that one thing has such a profound effect on our lives in every single area, Okay. So, but the first thing we see here, Satan is a murderer. Now, how does he murder uh, us? He does it through lies. He is the father of lies. This is why I hate lying so much. Satan is the father of lies. Nobody has ever told a lie without, um, without, you know, without parenting uh, Satan's children. So, look, you can look at it that way. A lie is Satan's child. So nobody has ever told a lie without parenting Satan's children. 
I know that sounds really harsh, and it is really harsh. And now, I believe all of us in here have probably told a lie at one time, right? I've told a lie, okay? So some of you be like, man, I'm going straight to hell. No, you're not. That's, that's, thank God for his grace, amen? If it wasn't for his grace, we'd all be going straight to hell. So, th- you know, praise God for the grace of God. But I'm just telling you, this is what a lie is. It is a child of Satan. And, and whenever we give in to that, that spirit of lying, we are parenting his children. So just be aware of that. Lying is never good. It, you know, it'll promise you, you know, there's, there's short-term benefit. But let me tell you, the long-term, you're just, it's, it's a way for Satan to wiggle his, room, his way into your life and murder you. And this is what Satan is doing. So there are many people that Satan is murdering, in, even in the body of Christ and in the world, because of his lies that he is spreading, because of his rumors, because of his gossiping. Amen? So we need to be aware of that. And the thing is, is that Satan, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really use, you know, bold-faced, outright lies to trap us and to get us. Satan, he, he's, he's sneaky, he's cunning, and he, he doesn't just approach you and tell you the opposite of what you believe. You know what he does is he gets you to question first what you believe before he tells you the opposite of what you believe when he lies to you. Satan doesn't, if I have a blue crayon, for example, Satan doesn't just tell to me, just doesn't just come to me and say, hey, you know, that crayon is green. He doesn't do that. What does he first do? He comes to me and he gets, he, using his, his cunningness and his craftiness, he gets me to question if that crayon is blue. Now, spiritually speaking, God loves us. God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die for the world, right? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't t- come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Amen. Hallelujah. But for some reason, Christians believe that, that God is in the you know, in the business of condemning and judging. So, and, and that's not at all what God's love is for. That's not at all why Jesus came. Amen? He came to redeem us and buy us back from that. But what Satan does is, in, instead of just telling us the opposite of, what, of the truth, he doesn't do that. He gets us to question the truth and its validity. And we're going to go into this much, much deeper next week. Um, Man, God is amazing, and his word is awesome. But we're going to go into this much deeper next week, but we're just going to kind of do a rundown today of this, okay? So Satan, he's, he's going to come to you in different ways. He's not going to lie straight to your face. He's going to first get you to question the truth and question what you believe. So what that means is that our ability to resist the lies that Satan throws at us is not based upon how strong or powerful the lie is, it's how strong we are in the truth. Amen? That's it. We have no reason to be afraid of Satan. We have no reason to be afraid of him. Because, yes, he's bringing lies to us, but in order, to, to, in order for him to even think about planning a lie in our mind, he has to get us to question the validity of the, the, validity of the truth. Okay, so we should not be scared of Satan or his lies or what he's going to do, because if you're strong in the truth, Satan Satan can't get you. He can't deceive you. The truth is what protects us. Amen? And we're going to talk about that more upcoming. But what I want to talk about a little bit more this morning is how Satan... Um, in the big picture, deceives us and how he lies to us and what he's after. Remember, we talked about in John 8, 44, that Satan is a murderer from the beginning. So we're going to talk about that one thing that he's after, to murder and to cripple in your life. Now, Satan, obviously, his, his ultimate goal is to get you to, um, to reject Christ and, 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 you know, renounce Christ and, and, you know, just live your own life, right? And, and ultimately spend eternity in hell. That's Satan's ultimate goal. But if Satan can't keep you in the dark, and he can't keep you from rejecting Christ with his lies, then what he's going to try to do is render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. He's going to try to render you ineffective in your uh, salvation, in your faith 
in Christ, in his finished work. Amen? So we have to be aware of that. Sometimes we think as Christians, just because you're saved and you're a Christian doesn't mean you're, you know, you're out of the dark, so to speak. Okay? Satan is still after you as a Christian. But again, if we stay strong in the truth, we'll be okay. All right? So let's jump over here to Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2.8. And we're going to read verses 8 through 10. Again, Satan's goal, if he can't keep us in the dark and, and, and lie to us and blind us to the point that we reject Christ, then he will attempt to do it to the point that we are not effective for Christ and we don't fulfill our purpose in Christ. So in Ephesians 2.8, uh, it says here, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Praise God. So... Uh, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in verse 8 there, there's two things that are necessary for salvation. Two components. Just like there's two things that are necessary for, for water, right? So for salvation, it's grace and faith. You cannot have one without the other, and it produces salvation. Grace alone does not save you, and faith alone does not save you. Amen? The grace of God is free, and it's available to all, and praise God for his grace. Grace has nothing to do with you or what you've done. It has everything to do with what God has freely provided because of his love for you. But just because God loves you does not mean that, that you just automatically step into his promises and his best. You need faith. Amen? you got to believe. In Hebrews, it says that unless you mix faith with the word, it does not profit you. The grace of God and the love of God is not going to profit you if you don't have faith. And that's why it's so important we have faith. Now, faith alone does not profit us. Amen? You can have all the faith in the world, but what does 1 Corinthians 13 say? Without love, you're nothing. We're just existing. <laughs> there, there's, without love, we're nothing. So we need grace and faith in order to produce salvation in our life. Now, what is the purpose of our salvation? Well, we see there the purpose of our salvation, for we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for what? What is our purpose? For good works. So the purpose of our salvation is good works. Okay, not religious works. Religious works is trying to earn God's grace. It's trying to earn God's love. It's trying to do good things to make sure that God is always pleased with you, that God always loves you. That, those are religious works. Those are, those are not good works. Those are dead works. Amen? We can't earn God's grace. And anytime we get into the habit of thinking that our performance is related to God's love or grace or acceptance of us, that's when we get into religion and dead works. That's not good works. Good works come out of our relationship with the Lord. It comes out of our love for the Lord. Amen? Amen? That's what good works. Good works come as a result of us knowing that God loves us, regardless of what we do or don't do. Hallelujah. Good works come as a result of us believing in the grace of God, that God cares about us and has provided the sacrifice for us, regardless of, of what we do. Amen? Amen? So that, that's what good works are. So the purpose of our salvation is good works. Hallelujah. Now, there are, <coughs> there are two variables that we see for salvation, and we can say and good works, which is grace and faith. Two variables in that, in that equation. So, you know, we know that the grace of God is constant, right? Because grace is based on God's love. And we know that God's love does not change. It is constant all the time. His grace is always available to us all the time. And I love that because no matter how I'm feeling, even if I'm feeling faithless, which I do at times, I know that God's grace is constant. And I can always surrender to his grace and repent at any time. And God always loves me. God always accepts me. It does not change. Amen? And the other variable, which is our part, is faith. Is, is us choosing to believe in what God has done for us. Choosing to believe in his love 
and grace that was given so freely unto us. Now Satan, again, he wants to render us ineffective so that we can't do good works. Satan wants to render us ineffective to where we don't fulfill the purpose of our salvation. And I believe this is a word from the Holy Spirit that, that I'm just hearing this, that some of you, some of you believe that your purpose have, has been taken and you have nothing to live for. Amen. Some of you believe your purpose has been taken from you and you have nothing to live for. But I'm telling you that the grace of God is constant. And God's purpose for you does not change. It is and it will always be good works. And God's grace and love is always there to make sure that you can do good works. It's a matter of will you believe? Will you believe? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So Satan wants to render us ineffective to where we don't fulfill our purpose, which is good works. Now, obviously, Satan is not going to defeat the grace of God. Again, the two variables that produce salvation, which produces good works. Now, first, I want us to understand, you cannot have good works apart from salvation. Amen. Do you know why the reason you can have good works is because of the grace of God? Amen. Hallelujah. If you try to do good works... Outside of the grace of God, God says all the good you're doing is just going towards your debt. You're not getting anywhere. We don't earn any right standing with God based on what we do. Hope we understand that. We don't earn that. Amen? Because our debt as, as, a, as a sinner apart from Christ, let's just pretend we're apart from Christ, our debt as a sinner apart from Christ without salvation is so enormous, no matter what good we do, it's going towards our debt. Anybody ever been in debt before? You don't have to raise your hand, okay? You've been in debt before. Maybe a lot of debt. You've been in that position where it doesn't matter how much you make in your paycheck, it all goes to the credit card companies, right? And, and you know, God loves you, but God wants to set you free from that. Because that's, that's not a, a way that he wants us to live. There's no condemnation to you if you're in that position but I'm here to tell you, God has more for you. Hallelujah. He wants you to be free. And God is not just concerned about your spiritual life. He's concerned about your earthly life. Amen. And for too, too, too long, religion has taught us that God is only concerned about your spiritual life. But we need to understand that spiritual things affect natural things. Faith affects natural things. Amen? So God is not just concerned about your spiritual life. He's concerned about your physical life as well, your natural life. So God wants you free from that. But, so we, need, we learn that apart from salvation, your good works are for nothing. So salvation is necessary for good works. Amen? Now, so, <laughs> so with, with salvation producing uh, good works in us, so what Satan wants to do is he can't attack God's grace. He tried that with Jesus and he failed. Amen? He tried that with Jesus. He tried to destroy the grace of God. Because what did Jesus say I came to do? Reveal grace and truth. So Satan said, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can control this variable. Because Satan doesn't want us to be saved. Satan doesn't want us to fulfill our purpose in, in, in doing good works. So Satan comes and, and he tries to destroy the grace of God. Well, he figured out he can't do that. He thought he did. And then Jesus rose three days later. So Satan's like, okay, I can't control that variable. I can't murder them or destroy them by controlling that variable. So what does he have left? Faith. He has faith. That he, so, so what we learn here is that God's grace is, is set in stone. Nothing can ever change the way that God feels about you. And it's not just a feeling that God has for you. It's, it's a deep, intimate love and, and passion for you that God has. And nothing can ever change that. Whether you're faithful or not faithful, nothing can ever change the way that God thinks about you. As, as Sister Sandra was talking about this morning, just how God thinks about us. He knows us. And he loves us. Nothing can ever change that. Amen? But what Satan wants to do, again, is render us ineffective from walking in the purpose of our salvation. And so, <clears throat> it's so important that we that we learn how important our faith is in the, life, in, in the life of a believer, in the life of a believer who is fulfilling his purpose in doing good works. 
This may seem like it's, it's too simple to some of you, but I want us to, to check this out. Again, as I said in the beginning, God, Satan is not desiring to, to kill your marriage. He's not desiring to kill your bank account. He's not desiring. He's after one thing, and it's your faith. One thing Satan is after is your faith. And that ought to sober us up and make us realize what our enemy is after because we spend so much time taking care of everything else in our life, but we don't take care of our faith. And that's the one thing that Satan is after. And the reason that Satan is so adamant about killing your faith is because we learn in James 1.7, faith is how we receive from God. Without faith, you are not receiving anything from God. Amen? So regardless of how much God loves you, regardless of how much grace is available to you, regardless of how passionate God is about you, apart from faith, you will not receive from God. Thank you, Lord. We learn in 1 John 5, 4, that faith is what gives us victory in life. We know God's grace isn't going to change. And sometimes we say, well, you know, my victory is really dependent upon um, God and what he wants to do in my life. That's not true. Your vic- because God's grace is constant. It's not changing. God always, you know, all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Why are all of his promises yes and amen in Christ? Because Christ is the grace of God. Amen. It doesn't change. God is always saying yes to every good thing he has for us. All the time. It is not whether God wants to do something good in our life. Grace has already made it available to us. But the key to our victory in life, the key to receiving from God in life is faith. And now we understand why Satan wants to kill our faith. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he's a murderer now. And he does it through lies. He is the father of lies. Satan just releases his children, which are lies, to destroy our faith. So we have to understand that that lies, deception, sin destroys our faith. It cripples our faith. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for forgiveness? I am. Because I've given in to lies before. I've given in to deceptions before. I've given in to sin before. I don't know if you guys have, but I have. I've given in to that. But thank God that not all was lost. Yes, Satan hurt my faith a little bit. And he did some damage to me. But thank God that God's grace is always constant. And at any time, I can repent and believe on the grace and the love of God, and it's always there. I can always rely on it. You guys ever had a friend that you can always rely on? Aren't they just like a ray of sunshine in your life? (laughs) And then you have that friend that you can never rely on. It's like leaning on a splintered stick. (laughs) Amen? Amen. Or grabbing a cactus. It hurts. (laughs) It hurts. Praise God. But God's grace is not so. Man, it's all, not only is it always there, it's always there in abundance. Whatever I need, God says, my grace is sufficient, son, and it's always there for you. Hallelujah. I am, I am so glad for the grace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So even if Satan does cripple or damage my faith, man, I can get right back in the game. Amen? So those of you who think, man, Satan really hurt me this way, and, and, and he lied to me this way, and I believed it, and he, you know, I got into sin, and, and Satan hurt my faith, and what am I going to do is, listen, what does faith come by? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you've been through, where you've gone. You just come back to God's word, and faith is restored. Faith comes, hallelujah, by hearing and hearing by the words of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can never go to the point of no return unless you choose to. 
It's up to you. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute here. The one thing Satan is after to kill in your life is your faith. And he will do it through lies. Through lies. And the thing is, is that Satan is so crafty and sneaky. The only possible way for us to protect ourselves from the lie is to trust the Holy Spirit. Is to lean on his word. Apart from Christ, we are no match for Satan. He's too crafty. He's too sneaky. But God gave us his word that we can abide in and live by. And God gave us his Holy Spirit to help us. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, he helps us in all of our weaknesses. And he intercedes for us according to the will of God. We have that promise. The only way to protect our faith, because Satan is coming after it, and he's coming after it hard, and he's not coming to play, he's coming to kill. Okay? The only way for us to protect our faith is to trust in the Holy Spirit. He can see the attack of Satan a mile away. And we need to trust in him. And the reason our faith is so important, everything good in your life is dependent on your faith in the grace of God. God's grace is not changing. The only variable is faith. Everything good that God has given you, has already given you, everything good will come to you from God by faith. Amen? So if Satan can kill our faith, he can steal everything away from us. We spend so much time, again, in, in life, let's just treat life like a garden. We spend so much time taking care of, of this area and that area and this area and, you know, fixing up our house and taking care, you know, loving, uh, loving our, I don't mean loving our wife, I guess I would say, you know, taking care of our wife, making sure her needs are met, taking care of our husbands, making sure his needs are met, and taking care of the kids and, and working and, and cleaning and doing this. We spend all this time focused on all this stuff and Satan's not wanting to distill any of that. What is he wanting to kill? Your faith. And that's the one thing that the body of Christ has, has most abandoned, is, is upkeeping their faith and tending to their faith. And when we don't do that, we leave ourselves, when we don't take care of our faith, we leave ourselves wide open for the enemy to come in and, and kill that one thing that is keeping our entire life alive. What did Jesus say? I am the vine, you're the branches. Amen. We get all of our life from the vine. And what, how do we get our life from the vine? We have to do it by grace through faith. And if Satan kills our faith, he's cut us off from the vine. And what does that mean when we're cut off from the vine? There is no longer life flowing in us. So if there's no life flowing in me, and there's no transfer of God's grace and love into my life, how am I able then to love my wife the way God has commanded me to? How am I able then to raise my kids up in the way they should go if I don't have the life of Jesus flowing in me? How am I able to do this? See, faith is what adds purpose to your life. Faith gives you real purpose. Because life is not just about maintaining a good marriage or, or raising good kids or working hard and, and paying the bills. Those are all necessary and you need that. But let me tell you the most important thing is faith. Now obviously 1 Corinthians 13 says abide, these three things abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Okay, but you understand I'm not talking about faith as greater than love. I'm talking about faith as greater than all the other things that we're tending to in our garden. Because God's love doesn't change. That's the most important thing. Praise God. Without his love, our faith is meaningless. Amen? So don't get it twisted. Your don't build your whole life on faith. <laughs> we need faith. But love is the most important. Without, without love, faith doesn't matter. Amen? 
But we don't need to tend to God's love. God's love is the same. God makes sure of that. Our part is to tend to our faith. Because that's the one thing Satan's after, and he will lie to you. And, and if you believe the lie, he will kill your faith and cripple your faith. Amen. Again, don't fret if you've allowed Satan to lie to you or deceive you. Praise God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's love is constant. If, if your faith has been crippled or hurt, you repent and you just get right back in the love of God. Amen? You get right back to believe and you get right back to staying connected to the vine. That's why repentance is so important. Some of us are so prideful, we don't think we ever do anything wrong. <laughs> Amen? And that's when we need to know, you know, what, is, what does the Bible say in 1 John? Let me, let me take us there. Some of you are like, well, I don't know. First John's, there's a lot the Bible says in 1 John. In 1 John, uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 8, what does he say there? He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Man, praise God. So, <laughs> all of us sin at certain times. I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm not, I'm not approving of that or dismissing that. But all of a sudden, you know, we have to come back to the love and the grace of God and say, God, my relationship with the Lord is not based upon how well I'm performing and, and how much faith I have in, in God. Like, God, if I don't have faith in you, you're not going to love me anymore. That's not true. God's love and grace is always constant. But my ability to receive is based on my faith. Hallelujah. It's not, my, my faith doesn't make God more of a giver. Do you understand? My faith doesn't make God want to bless me more. My faith has nothing to do with how much of God's grace or love is in my life. His grace and love is constant, all the time, the same. We have to get that in our minds. But faith is my ability to receive. Faith doesn't affect God in the sense of God's going to give you more if you have faith. And if you don't have faith, God's not going to give you it. My faith doesn't affect God's giving. My faith affects my receiving. I got quiet in here. If my faith affects God's giving, that means that God's love and grace is dependent on my faith. Amen. And if I don't have faith, that means God doesn't love me. And that is not true. That's what religion teaches us, but that is not true. God's love and grace is always the same. Faith does not affect God's ability to give. It affects my ability to receive. And for so long, Christians who have not tended to their faith, but have had things, you know, they've been lied to and deceived, and Satan had an entry into the life, and he destroyed some things, and and things happen because, the, you know, they weren't tending to their faith and Satan killed their faith. And, and Christians say, well, God must not want, want me healed or God must not want me free or God must not want my marriage restored or God must not want, you know, me to be a rich man or a rich woman because I'm, I'm struggling from week to week. I'm in, I'm in debt all the time. God, faith does not affect God's ability to give. It affects your ability to receive. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with what God has or has not given you has nothing to do with God's grace or love, has everything to do with your faith. Your faith. There is no condemnation to you this morning because God's love and grace is constant this morning. So if you're in debt, if you're sick, if you're broke, busted, and disgusted, <laughs> God loves you. And he loves you so much that he made a way for you to go from being broke, busted, and disgusted to being rich, blessed, and wise, Amen. and full of life. But God is saying, I'm not going to get you from here to there just simply by me loving you. God's saying, I need you to have faith. I need you to get in my word, and I need you to start believing the promises that I have given you. I need you to start believing the love that I have for you, the grace that has richly and freely supplied everything that you need in life. 
Because one thing Satan is after is your faith. That's it. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Let's go to Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19. So, as we said in the beginning, in order for Satan to lie to us, he has to get us first to question the, valid the validity of the truth, okay? So, my ability to resist the lie is not based upon how strong or powerful the lie is. So, if God gives, or, or I'm sorry, if Satan just sends some kind of sh strong lie or delusion my way, I have no chance against it. No, it's all based on how strong am I in the truth. Amen? The, the health and the quality of my faith has nothing to do with Satan. Everything to do with me. How am I treating my faith? How am I tending to my faith? That determines the health of my life. And, and too often, we have blamed others and said, Satan did this, that's why my faith is not strong. That's why I can't receive, that's why I have no victory. Satan did this, or my mom did this, my dad did this, my grandpa did this, or... You know, whatever it may be, but your faith, only you can determine the health of your faith. I'm not saying things don't come against you in life that, I'm trying to make sure I wear this, I'm not saying things don't come against you in life that are challenging. That's not what I'm saying. Your faith will be tested. We've talked about that. It will be tested. You will have tribulation in the world, but, somebody say, but, be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. So when you're challenged, what do you do? You tend to your faith. You tend to your faith when your faith is being tested. And you let patience have its perfect work that you may be a perfect man lacking nothing. Why does it say lacking nothing? Because if you tend to your faith, faith is how you receive from God. Faith is how you walk in victory. Hallelujah. It doesn't open God's hand to give you more. It opens your heart to receive more. Thank you, Lord. And when we're tending to our faith, we're tending to our ability to receive what God has already given us according to his love and his grace. Hallelujah. Again, I keep saying this because religion has taught us differently. Faith does not open, uh, does not create uh, more of an ability for God to give. Faith creates more of an ability for us to receive. So Luke 10, 19. It's, our faith is based upon us. Luke 10, 19. And that's why you should let nobody judge your faith. What does the Bible say? Your faith is between you and God. In Romans 14, some people esteem the Sabbath above other days. Some people say, don't eat this. Some people say, it's okay to eat that. And Lockhart, I don't think we have a problem with that. We're all good on eating pork, right? I think we're all good on that, okay? But, you know, some people say, don't eat this. Don't eat. What, what does it say in Romans 14? It says, live according to your faith. Have your faith between you and God. Amen? Don't let people judge your faith. Praise God. You don't stand or fall before them. You stand or fall before God. God loves you. And that's what gives me confidence is his love. Hallelujah. Somebody try to come up and steal my confidence, make me think that God doesn't love me because of, because of a certain decision or whatever I made. Who are you to tell me God doesn't love me? Who are you to tell me that, that God doesn't have as much grace towards me as he does towards you? You hypocritical, big-headed. You whitewashed tomb, as Jesus said. Who are you to tell me that God doesn't love me as much as he loves you? Thank you, Lord. Somebody tried to tell you that, you just Bible slap them. And then you give them a hug to let them know that Jesus still loves them. <laughs> Regardless of their, their hypocritical spirit, Jesus still loves them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, Luke 10, 19. <laughs> what does Jesus say here? He said, Behold, I give, you, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions 
and over all the power of the... Did, did, did Jesus just say here that he's given us authority over all the power of the enemy? Is that what he said? And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Is that, is that true? Are we reading from this? He's given me authority over all the power of the enemy. What is the power of the enemy? Lies. He's the father of it. But he's given me authority over all that. And then in verse 20, he says, it's probably not up there, but verse 20, the Lord says, rejoice about your salvation. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. What does he say? Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Don't rejoice because you can cast out demons and because you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Don't rejoice. What are you saying? God, Jesus is saying, don't rejoice because of the good works. Rejoice because of your salvation. Amen. For apart from salvation, good works don't exist. Hallelujah. But he tells us here, you have authority over all the power of the enemy. Did you know, in closing here, that I have authority to deny you access into my house? Why do I have that authority? Because it's my house. I own it. Amen? That's why I have authority to deny you. If it wasn't my house, I wouldn't have that authority. It's my house. Amen. Some of us need to get that same spirit. Satan, mom, dad, whoever it is, brother, sister, cousin, this is my faith. Satan comes at you trying to lie to you. This is my faith. Hallelujah. You have authority to deny Satan access into your life. You have authority when Satan comes knocking on your door with his craftiness and cunningness to attempt to kill your faith. You have authority to, to deny him access. But for too long we've said, well, I don't know, God may have a plan in this. And we just swing the doors and all the windows wide open because we're ignorant. I mean that in a loving way, okay? We just don't know how important it is we tend to and protect our faith. Don't open your doors and windows. Somebody's going to come in and steal something from you. Don't be dumb. <laughs> God loves you, okay? But don't be that dumb person that God loves. <laughs> be a smart person that God loves. And the reason I say that is because it'll save you so much trouble in life. It really will. Praise God. It's funny to me as Christians, you know, we know, man, we need to lock our doors at night and set our alarm, whatever, at night. Why? So nobody comes in that isn't supposed to. But spiritually speaking, no, we just, let me just leave the doors wide open. Don't you know there's an enemy out there looking to kill your faith? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have authority to deny you access into my house because it's my house and I own it. Hallelujah. We have authority to deny Satan access into our life. <laughs> and in order for us to deny Satan access into our life, what do we have to do? We have to own our life. We have to own the authority we have in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Whenever we throw out excuses, like, well, for, for whatever reason that we're in the tragedy that we're in, whenever we throw out excuses, we're not taking ownership of our life. You can't control the challenges you face and what comes against you, but you can control your faith and how you respond to the challenge. You can't control your faith being tested, because it will be, but you can control how you respond. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We need to own our life. Somebody say, own my life. We need to own our life. Own it. Others cannot control what you did not surrender to them. Amen? We need to stop living life and stop living in our faith like we're simply renting it. 
We need to own it. Own your faith. Own your life. Own your authority. And deny access to anyone who would come in and try to kill or steal your faith. Own your life. Too many Christians are renting it. They're renting their life. What happens to a rental? It gets trashed. Why? Because it's not yours. Come on. I don't do it because I love God, and God told me to do unto others as, <laughs> as I want to do unto myself. But there are people who will trash rental cars. They don't care. They'll, they'll drive them crazy. They'll, they'll drive those rental cars. Just you know, they, they don't care what happens to that car. They'll trash their homes if they're renting them. I'm not saying you guys do that because you guys love the Lord, right? And we're representing the Lord Jesus Christ in this earth. But there are people who will do that. Why? Because it's not theirs. Too many Christians, we're, we're living like we're, we're renting out our faith. We need to live in faith. We need to own our faith. Not just rent it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. You have authority over all the power of the enemy. So stop asking God for that authority because Jesus said, I have given you that authority. Amen? Amen. I have given you faith. I have spoken. That's what Jesus is saying. I've spoken. There is your faith right there. So if you feel like you've lost faith, Brother Mizzell, can I have you come play, please? If you feel like you've lost faith, this is how you find it. And you know what? Some of us have been through some tough challenges in life to where, you know, we feel like our, our faith is kind of crippled. We feel like we're kind of limping through life right now. And we're like we're renting our life right now. Like we don't really own it. We feel like we're not in, in control of our life because of things that are coming against us. Take control of it. God says, this is your life. I've given you authority. I've given you, this is your faith. God says, my love and grace for you has not changed. Did Jesus not die for you? Did he not rise again for you? That, that sealed God's love and grace in your life. Right there. God says, you need to own your authority, own your life, own your faith. Stand up. Take back what's yours. Stop allowing Satan to just lie to you and come in and kill your faith and, and destroy your family and, and just, d- just disperse you like you're nothing. Stop allowing Satan to destroy your life. Hallelujah. I pray that we understand more this morning about who Satan is, what he's after. He's after one thing, your faith. And I pray that we'd be encouraged to take heart, to take ownership of our life and stop blaming, stop making excuses. It's your faith. And God loves you And he always has. And he's calling you to rise up and take ownership. Take ownership. Nothing gets done. Nothing improves if you blame and make excuses. And all of us can. Because sometimes the challenge is hard. But when you go to God's word, your faith is lifted up. And you're able to find the strength to stand one more day. And you're able to find the strength to believe God for one more thing. Because you know that his love and his grace has never failed you. Father, I thank you that right now you are restoring hope. You're restoring hope. Jesus' name. May the voice of your love and your grace be louder than the challenge. May the the voice of your love and grace be more be stronger and more powerful than the voice of the enemy who's screaming lies and hurling insults our way. We know that Goliaths will rise up in our life and they will taunt you and they will say to us, where is your God? 
But we know, Father God, that our faith in you allows us to defeat the Goliaths in our life with one stone. One stone is all it takes. And God is here to say this morning, belief is all it takes. Just believe. He knows your heartache. He understands your pain. But he says, just believe and watch me work. See what I can do. God has never stopped loving you since the beginning. Satan may have been a murderer from the beginning, but God has been our lover, our first lover, and the giver of life from the very beginning. Thank you, Lord. All things were good when he created it. And what we need to understand is that you too are a creation of God. And you are good. And God created you for good works. Don't let Satan steal your purpose because of some temporary obstacle that you're facing right now. God's plan and his love and grace is too big for that. Don't forsake the enormous, great, majestical plan of God in your life for some measly lie that Satan is selling you. Don't give up. Don't give in. Help is on the way. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. Look within. When you need help, look, don't look without. Look within. Faith is there. The Holy Spirit is there. God has given you his word for you to overcome. The key to your victory, the key to your receiving from God is your faith. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for that word this morning, Father. Again, we thank you for your Holy Spirit restoring hope in our hearts. Thank you for reminding us of the eternal calling, of the eternal passion in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, somebody say, so be it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If there is anybody in this house today, and you're saying, I need to know this God that you're talking about. He provided the way through Jesus Christ for, you, for all your sins to be forgiven, for you to know him, and he's calling you this morning. If you don't know him, you need to know him. Because <laughs> there's no high like the most high. Amen. If you're in this house today and, you, and you're saying, I want to give my life to the Lord, I want you to go ahead and raise your hand right where you're at so we can pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid of what anybody else thinks or says. This is about your faith. This is about your relationship with God. And God loves you eternally. Thank you, Lord. Anybody? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Praise God. We're good. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray, and, and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for loving us, and uh, man, it's, it's so amazing to know you, Lord. And I just pray that, you know, we'd be more equipped as we go out today to carry your love with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name. And we thank you that in any and every situation, your love and your grace is enough. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. We love, let's give the Lord a hand clap. God is so good. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We love you all. God bless you. Have a great, wonderful day. Um, we'll be up here to pray with you if you need prayer. Amen.